they just don't have the taboos about Christianity that we do. They're not as afraid to use them for narrative purposes as we if are. If it was that clear, the whole world would be Christian. It's not like freaking Dragon Quest, where you go to the temple and pray to the goddess and then your party member gets resurrected. In Dragon Quest, it's clear that the church is just put in there because it's just there. They're, they're usually more <laughs> In a long-running series like Dragon Quest, making statements about curiosity and questioning the status quo, you know that eventually one of the games is bound to prod at its own foundation. The franchise spawned an abundance of spin-offs over the years, all sharing some common features. They all have slimes, you can count on the intermezzo theme playing while selecting your adventure log, and you save at a church. This gag, made in passing, has become expected, synonymous with Dragon Quest, but it is so rarely talked about and even where were understood, neither by the community nor by the games themselves, with a few exceptions of course. And that's to be expected, there's usually not much to it. And the games don't take place in a shared world, thus their churches as well are vastly different and can be created. Most games settle with prayer to an unspecified goddess, but it is slightly more specific in the early games with Rubis. The first game however that dared to ask the questions that never needed to be asked, only because it could, that was Dragon Quest 7 with its plot revolving around religion. Literally as you explore how the world works as well as introspectively as Dragon Quest 7 dissects one of its own series' long standing and so far unchallenged traditions. It is imperative that we don't degrade the worlds of these games, it's all too easy to fall into this pitfall. They have different rules as well as structures, so it's beyond the scope of this video to discuss the one Dragon Quest. Consequently, if we attempt to understand Dragon Quest 7, we have to understand the specifics of its reality. Or lack thereof, because despite the 16,000 A4 pages of scripts, there are still things left up to interpretation. A farther challenge is the constant change of the heavenly dynamics as you progress. So if we are chronologically going through this world's genesis, then we are immediately at the first roadblock. What came first, the almighty or the humans? It's never outright stated that the almighty created humans, at least not by any credible source. The spirits only speak of him planting two seeds from which the future shall grow, the other being the spirits. You don't create a seed, you only give it nourishment it needs to prosper. And we know the Almighty didn't create the spirits, he split off these four as parts of him. Were humans originally part of the Almighty as well? We don't know. But we know that he is very much finite, not omnipotent as the name implies. It's paradoxical. The Almighty created humanity. But the same Almighty grew weak because humans stopped believing in him as Ogodemir later divided the world and deceived the remaining people into believing that this was all as the Almighty wanted it to be. How was he ever powerful enough to start humanity if he's reliant on them? What is clear is only the end result. Human belief could create an Almighty. The Providence event is relevant for this. The people there worship an undefined goddess, like in the old Dragon Quest titles. And unlike the absent Almighty, she actually seems to protect the people. That is, until a later event reveals that the statue was powered by humans themselves. For this people-oriented world, it's only natural that the villain himself is powered by humans. It's unclear where he came from, but Ogodemir gets powered by human prayer as well, or rather gemstones that were imbued with prayer. He and the Almighty are the expected duality of good versus evil and their fight ends in arguably a draw. More on this in a bit, but after Ogodemir gets destroyed for the first time, it's humans that are manipulated into reviving him at all. Ogodemir's power might come from people as well, but he deceives or coerces people. After manipulating people into reviving him, he poses as the Almighty and is thus worshipped as the Almighty and possibly powered by human prayers. And in a sense this is a snowball effect, where as his influence grows, he gets more means of growing even farther. 
but power and influence are all he wants. He doesn't want to destroy the world because without humans he as well would be powerless. The monsters that are depicted as an unspecified force of evil don't exist in a vacuum. They only exist in opposition to humans. They aren't defined by the ugly or evil, just a hatred for everything beautiful and good. They're the darkness that attempts to overshadow the light, not something that exists by itself. In that sense, Orgodimir posing as a mockery of a prideful human is his attempt at becoming human, becoming independent from them, but it's simply not allowed by his nature. Earlier, when I said that the struggle between Orgodimir and the Almighty ended in a war, I wasn't telling the full story. Orgodimir didn't ever lose to the Almighty, he killed the Almighty and simply spent his power, putting him on standby. It was you as a human hero that put an end to him. But killing or ending these aren't the correct terms. In both cases, it's only the physical shell of these beings being destroyed while the soul lives on. And while I have discussed the souls of people, animals and even things in this game before, we are now speaking of the souls of concepts, of good and evil, light and darkness. And it just so happens that both get revived. And both times, it's through people. It's implied the Almighty was revived by people's renewed belief in him. And we know that Orgodimir's resurrection was more tangible. I will go as far as to equate the souls of the concepts of good and evil with people's perception of them. We also don't know how the world came to be. We don't know about the afterlife, we don't know where the islands are sealed away to. Are the ones sealed away in the present and the later event the same as the ones sealed away in the past? Only that not enough time has passed to actually put them in the past. Time is seemed to work normally in there. Are the sealed away ones simply put on hold or are they immediately put into the past? Because time does pass and not even in a linear fashion. For example, decades passed between two of your Emberdale visits using the tablet. And of course, the question of where they are put. Is this the dark realm where monsters originate from? An alternate reality? Do the sealed away islands exist in the same plane of existence? How about the tablets of the Almighty? Are those just places in the present that are out of reach? Or is this a heaven of sorts that doesn't exist in the realm of humans? This ambiguity is the main point I'm trying to convey with this section. There's still a lot unknown about the world. You can never truly know everything, and yet the game focuses on a search for truth. The messages this has are enforced throughout so many details in this game that I would need to keep bringing them up if I didn't get them out of the way now. Dragon Quest 7 is about the value of curiosity, about open-mindedness, self-emancipation, about not accepting the status quo, about having faith in people around you because humans are the answer, and about believing in yourself first and foremost because sky really is the limit. So to end this section I want to create a timeline of Dragon Quest 7's world, clearing up as much as possible. Ultimately you will find time to flow surprisingly linearly. You could even structure this entire thing into a single line. I've opted to omit finer details, like how the Almighty split off the at first irrelevant elemental spirits, and I've bunched a lot of events together into past events as well as your adventure. This part of the game that I've previously described as a collection of fairy tales isn't impactful on an individual level. Not every event meaningfully changes the world as a whole. They are all small steps towards restoring the world to its former glory and beyond while growing the protagonist into the hero the world needs him to be. Gnosticism is not one unified set of beliefs. The strands that I do want to look at are the ones that emerged in the first two centuries of the Christian era as a means of interpreting scripture in the eastern Mediterranean area. How come evil exists in spite of an all-powerful God? How come the world is imperfect? And how come God can be so cruel? The answer that Gnostics reached is that the God that created the world in Genesis is not benign and not all-powerful either. He simply rules over the material cosmos as a lesser deity, the Demiurge, while a transcendent supreme god, specifics on them vary, stays hidden from us in a different realm. The Garden of Eden story is now interpreted as man's first step to escaping from the knowledge, escaping from the garden. 
no longer the original sin. The Demiurge was simply jealous of them and their divinity and thus tried to keep them from awakening to knowledge. He lied to them that they would die if they ate from the tree, but it was an empty threat because he doesn't hold that kind of power. It's a far cry from the orthodox interpretation of these story elements. Many Gnostics hold material existence in contempt, and it is only through diligent self-exploration and growth, by seeking hidden mysteries and secret wisdom, not through an organization like the church, but through individual spiritual life, that one can attain salvation by knowledge or gnosis. And one who has achieved gnosis does not submit to spiritual or any kind of authority. But true knowledge isn't easily accessible. Gnostics had an obsession with the esoteric. Some strands even went so far as to call everything from the physical world, everything we normally perceive, nothing more than appearance and illusion. And as you might imagine, this goes hand in hand with some schools even seeing those who can achieve gnosis as an elite. The general idea is that humans live in the world but are more than worldly beings. They are of divine descent or have divine potential, yet suffer under the tyranny of a lesser deity. They are imprisoned in the material plane. And Gnosis is the only way to liberate each individual divine spark. Gnosticism was appealing because it explains the world in such a way that it mirrors what people see it as, a godforsaken mess. But without getting specifically into one school of Gnosticism, I can't explain the world much farther. The Demiurge might be characterized as arrogant, evil and defective. He might not even be the creator of the world to begin with, but simply the one who governs it. The serpent from the Garden of Eden story might be framed as the wisest animal in the kingdom trying to show humanity the way to Gnosis. Meanwhile, the Bogomils, a Gnostic sect that surely won't be important again later, believed that the Demiurge, who they equate with Satan, created Earth as a way of imitating the real God, who created the heavenly realm. But he failed to breathe life into the humans he made. He could only create the serpent, an abomination and thus satanic offspring. So we can't really get far without specifying the strand. There's only a few common values that were almost universally shared among Gnostic sects. The god that rules over the material world is not almighty. He is lesser and he does not hold authority over humans that have reached their full potential. The human mind is always seen as something divine. The mystic, esoteric and spiritual are given importance while the material is denounced. Especially individual experiences with other planes that the material one are put on a pedestal. Gnosticism deals in dualisms, the heavenly and the degenerate earth, knowledge and ignorance. The heavenly rulers over the divine realm juxtaposed with the demiurge and potentially more rulers over the cosmos in different realms that I may or may not have skipped over for simplicity's sake and that may or may not vary depending on the specific school. Beyond the worldview, even humans are seen as dualistic in nature. Their shell is weak and transient, while their soul, or as it's often called, divine spark, is eternal. And inherently, Gnosticism is born from the idea of reading the pre-established scripture in an alternative way, questioning the status quo. Hmm, haven't I heard that somewhere before? The world in Dwayne Quest 7 isn't supposed to match a traditional biblical cosmology, else the Almighty would be omnipotent. Else setting off on your own adventure at the beginning, escaping from this Garden Eden would have been wrong, sinful even. There's a false interpretation where we make the protagonist out to be an equivalent to Jesus Christ, but that's a dead end. You will have much greater success looking at Dwayne Quest 7's world through a Gnostic Christian lens. First, something I want to get out of the way is that we can't use the NPC called the Gnostic to draw any meaningful parallel, since he is just an unnamed ancient sage in the Japanese version. The rest of his dialogue is faithfully translated and he represents the same thing, forgotten wisdom and the mystical, so for once I like how the localizers were thinking, but that's as far as we can get with him. But if we're already talking about names, Ogodemir etymologically resembles the Demiurge. It seems to be a compound word derived from the Demiurge and the Latin word Orgo, meaning with pride. This of course is redundant since the Demiurge is already defined by pride, but their pride isn't the only thing connecting the two. 
Similar to how the Demiurge is keeping humans bound to the material realm, the entirety of your community at the start of Dragon Quest VII is bound to a single island. And through the mystic tablets you can awaken to the truth of the world and explore different realms. This knowledge not only makes you achieve an understanding of the world as a whole, achieve an equivalent of Gnosis, but you then go on to spread this knowledge among your community so that they too might learn the truths. In a sense your home island at the beginning parallels what many Gnostic sects truly regard their contemporary orthodox Christians as. They falsely believe in a god that ensures order, they trust that he is the answer to everything and thus never go searching for farther truths. But ultimately they know so little, only the tiniest fraction of the world is accessible to them. And similar to Plato's allegory of the cave, it's only when you lead them to the light that they truly understand what they've been missing all this time. This process needs you as a pioneer, someone who by himself as an individual goes out on an adventure. It's not a communal effort. In that sense, your party with Kiefer as its leader parallels what some Gnostics truly saw themselves as. Liberators that know of the mystic, secrets unbeknownst to everyone around them, who travel to planes beyond the generally known one. And as the story progresses, Ogodemir disguises as the Almighty. He's done so centuries ago. The one everyone's been worshipping, the one you and the Romans have been trying to revive, was nothing more than an evil and cruel beast. But you alone, as an experienced adventurer, have the power to rise above his false authority. And in the end, humanity prevails. They have the inherent strength to stand above this self-proclaimed divine. But if Orgodomir takes the place of what Gnostics see the biblical God as, then what about the Almighty that on first view simply seems to be the traditional Christian God? And to that the answer is ambiguous. Do we see the Almighty as the supreme God over the heavenly realm? That doesn't fit since he didn't create Orgodomir, he doesn't stand above him. So do we see him as a human that achieved Gnosis? Maybe as the concept of Gnosis, means of escaping from realms you were chained to? There's an argument to be made here, since he is the invisible guiding hand throughout the game. He made the shrine of secrets that allows you to explore the different realms to begin with, and Agnostic would truly be able to do that. And when you meet him, he is surprisingly human and down to earth, and eventually, at the end of the game, you even become an equal to him. He could be seen as representative of what might have been a mentor or leader in Agnostic sect. And depending on the specific sect we're talking about, the degree to which the Demiurge is evil incarnate varies, meaning there's even a way of spinning this that makes the Almighty the equivalent to the Demiurge. He is the creator of the world, but only the material one. Ogodemir was the one who created Father Realms. He isn't all powerful either. He can't protect the people from evil and he himself loses to it. People worship him as Almighty, but he is not. Ignoring that Orgodomir twisted the past to impersonate the Almighty, the idea of an Almighty they had, even in the past, was nothing more than exaggeration. He is the one who we think of as the equivalent to the Biblical God, the one Gnostics would call the Demiurge. And he is the one that should have been there to protect people from evil and failed, and ultimately it is he who you become independent from at the end of your journey. I hope this illustrated my point. This is as far as we can go, comparing Dragon Quest VII to a very broad and loosely defined collective Gnosticism. The Bogomils were a Gnostic sect founded by the 10th century Bulgarian priest Bogomil and are often cited to have been a reactionary movement, a rebellion against contemporary oppressions. But I don't want to dwell on their history. All that matters for this purpose is their cosmology. The Bogomil worldview is dualistic in nature. The Supreme God in their story had two children, Satan Nail and Michael. I'm mispronouncing one of them and I have no idea which one. Satan Nail is the equivalent to the Demiurge. He rebelled against his father, was then expelled from heaven but still wanted to match or surpass him. So he created a world of his own, thus creating earth. And possibly there's other angels and other lower realms that I am cutting for simplicity's sake. But when it came to creating life, Satan Nail failed and as mentioned before, couldn't breathe life into Adam. He only ended up creating an abomination in the serpent. He had to beg his father to breathe life into Adam for him. In that sense, Satan Nail is characterized as arrogant yet incompetent. An embarrassment. 
God did this he was asked out of his goodness and because Satanale argued that man might one day occupy the heavenly seats that were left vacant after he, alongside possibly cut for time angels, were banished from heaven. But the humans were now equal to Satanale, also direct descendants of God. So Satanale forced Adam to sell himself and all future generations to him to be allowed to live on earth or in other words Satanale's creation. Satanale later was stripped of his divinity and became Satan either as punishment after he impregnated Eve with Cain who in that story is a direct son of Satan, or after his brother Michael was sent down to earth as Jesus and stripped him of it by destroying the clay tablet that the contract between him and Adam was etched into. The stories vary. Bogomils claimed that Satan then went on to create the Orthodox Church to still retain some power over the people. It's a myth that might very well have been developed backwards only out of spite for the Orthodox Church. What's interesting however is that Michael as Jesus was still framed as everything good and holy by Bogomils and the crucifixion was said to have been Satan's doing. In that sense there's still the same idea of an ongoing struggle between these brothers, Michael and Satan Nail or as they would later be known Christ and Satan. Even the Bogomils themselves continuously attempted to fight against evil with conjurations and rituals. Compared to more general Gnosticism, it's much easier to draw parallels between Bogomilism and Dragon Quest VII. Dragon Quest VII doesn't necessarily harbor Bogomil values and beliefs. I do think it holds a contrasting message about religious inclusion and respect. But Dragon Quest VII's world almost perfectly matches the Bogomil cosmology. In this comparison, Satan would be equivalent to Orgodomir and the Almighty would be equivalent to Michael and thus the Bogomil version of Jesus Christ. Orgodomir and the Almighty are equally as powerful. And if we regard Orgodomir defeating the Almighty as a stand-in for the crucifixion of Christ that was orchestrated by Satan, the world state after the crucifixion matches the one after Orgodomir was revived and posted the Almighty. Orgodomir, like Satan, is arrogant, deceitful and claims to be much more than the actual Almighty. He becomes the object of worship and founder of Dranquist Sevens equivalent to the Orthodox Church. He long ago put in place these universally accepted falsehoods about the world and oppresses everyone that claims otherwise, representative of the oppression that encouraged real world Bogomilism. In both cases however, before the force of good was killed by the Antichrist, he left behind hope for humanity, either in the form of a shattered clay tablet, releasing them from their contract with Satan and allowing them to achieve gnosis, enter different realms and not be bound to the one Satan created, or in the form of fragmented tablets that allow whoever finds them to find out the reality of the world, travel to different realms and pass that knowledge along. Where these stories differ however is that the Bogomil's worldviews weren't a finished story. They claimed that people were caught in the world state and still needed to escape from it. And while similarly within the world of Dragon Quest VII you can't play in a world state where Orgodomy has been defeated, similar to what Bogomil texts claim to enable, you uncover the truth behind Orgodomy disguised as the Almighty that you revived and you, through your individual attributes, are able to fight against and deliver yourself from evil for good. And finally, you're an equal to even Orgodomir and the Almighty themselves. The same way that humans as well as Michael and Satanail were equally children of the same higher deity. So what's the point of this exercise in mental gymnastics? So what if the Dragon Quest VII world is constructed similarly to what some obscure Gnostic sect believed the world to be like? What matters is the impact on the consumer and given just how esoteric this is, barely anyone is going to notice. Well, what I want to argue is that understanding where Dragon Quest VII draws from adds to the experience, but even when you don't understand that, these elements still add something of value to the final product. The fact that you can approximate Dragon Quest VII's world using real beliefs people used to hold goes a long way in showing that it is structured as a real mythos. And given how so many of the subplots approximate folklore, tying it all up with this approximation of religious beliefs is the logical next step. Dragon Quest VII consistently draws from myth throughout the game and now it draws from this esoteric source. The core message is still about curiosity and its value, and by drawing from this obscure faith system, like with all those myths, the game invokes a state of wonder. 
It invites the players to themselves search for hidden knowledge and expand their horizons. To further put themselves in the shoes of the protagonist, who is equally confused and lost, but taking in all the mysterious things around him. The game uses Gnosticism and Bogomilism specifically as a tool to combine form and function, to make a story drawing inspiration from esoteric sources that in itself is about using curiosity to uncover the esoteric. This wasn't where I meant for this video to go. My original vision was to compare the world of Dragon Quest VII to Orthodox Christian cosmology and clear up why it doesn't quite fit as much as some people think. Then compare it to Gnostic cosmology with the Almighty as the Demiurge and point out some of the shortcomings with that approximation. I would have talked about how it reinvented the already existing idea of a Dragon Quest church and breathed life into it for the first time. Then I would have ended on the note that all this ties into the core message of Dragon Quest VII. To make your own path in life. To not let the opinions around you influence you too deeply. Dare to venture out of your comfort zone from time to time. It would have been a Gnostic message, but it would have been about the absence of a fitting approximation, about how Dragon Quest VII did its own thing. It would have only been a debunking of the surface level analysis that the church and Dragon Quest VII, as well as the Almighty, are supposed to parallel the Orthodox Christian Church as well as God. Maybe I would have mentioned a second layer of Gnostic interpretation with Orgodomir's Demiurge, juxtaposed with the interpretation of Orgodomir as the serpent, but as I kept reading more and more Gnostic scripture, as well as secondary literature about Gnostic scripture, and as I realized just how closely Bogomilism and this interpretation of the Almighty as their Jesus Christ and of Orgodomir as their Satan match, this video warped time and time again. And now I'm the one making an esoteric video about a here in the West esoteric video game and its parallels to an esoteric Gnostic sect. And you're here watching. I do not think that this interpretation of Dragon Quest VII as a Gnostic or Bogomil mythos is the one true way of reading it and there are no alternatives. There are a few more inconsistencies, for example the way I framed everything it sounds like you're saving the people trapped on Astart when in fact they are presumably the only island not sealed away. But also when every other island is sealed away it's hard to say that Astart isn't. Regardless this is indisputably a part of the game. But despite its Gnostic focus on nurturing curiosity and the uncovering of hidden knowledge, Dragon Quest VII is a bit more mellow when it comes to judging differing views. When they are not harmful, why not have them? While it's stated that curiosity should never be inhibited, look no farther than Kiefer, the one who initially embodies curiosity. He dedicated his life to trying to revive the Almighty as a Roma, only for said Almighty to have been Orgodimir, evil incarnate all along. But his life was good, Kiefer never learned of that. He wasn't unhappy and therefore him not knowing didn't do any harm. It's the same reason why I can't dismiss the wild fan theories there are for these games. If that makes the world a little more exciting for you to believe that Kiefer saw Goldemir, then that's great and nobody can take that away from you. Even though the theory is more that Kiefer was originally supposed to be Orgodemir, rather than him being Orgodemir in the game's current state. And similarly, if you think the Bogomil elements are unintentional and don't have any meaning, if you're convinced that Dragon Quest VII is a simple game and you want it to stay that way, that decision is yours to make and your view isn't any less valuable. Dragon Quest is many different things for different people and it panders to many different crowds. They are games for everyone and Dragon Quest VII even throws the ones who dig around in Gnostic scripture a bone. There are no assumptions to be made about these connections. I have no idea what, if anything, the devs were thinking and I honestly couldn't care less. But here they are and it is just one more layer to this game. I think any piece of art can be greater than and will never be exactly what its creator envisioned it to be. But whether it actually is doesn't matter since the creator's original vision is irrelevant in my eyes. All the consumer gets is the product. And here in a game. A collaborative work, further distorted through localization and relocalization, it's impossible to tell apart intentions. Maybe how we intended or Goldemir to have been Kiefer all along. And maybe he concretely modeled the world after Bogomil cosmology and this isn't coincidental. Maybe he really just did whatever and didn't put any care into the game. But the game as it currently exists is something that I regard as carefully crafted. Over this video series, I've grown to like Dragon Quest VII. It's quite alright if you take your time and think about what's happening in the story instead of rushing through. 
What I remembered as incoherent nonsense turned out to be deeply interconnected as well as filled with intertextual references and nods. The storytelling is oftentimes extremely subtle. And finding out these esoteric little details like how there are stories about the mermaid's moon foreshadowing it before you ever find it, how the retelling of the battle between the Almighty and Orgodomir swapped their worlds around since they are just lies spread by Orgodomir himself, and so many more that I don't want to put into a montage. Every time, finding them gave me this feeling of exploration and discovery, of treading new ground and of adventure more than any other game has in a long time. There's a tiniest of chances that I'm simply going crazy while trying to make sense of something nonsensical, but the experiences I had exploring this game are real, and that is one thing I can say for certain.